the governor rewrote their proposal together, they have decided to drop their uh, signatory gathering signatures. Now, I heard he was going to continue trying to gather signatures for his, but I don't know if he's dropped that. He's only now gathering it for the duel. You know, Mike? He's uh, continuing to gather it for his because if the duel doesn't get enough signatures by the end of the month, right, he wants his to will still go on. And is CFT still gathering, you know? I believe they are also, they are, okay. but they're putting their main effort in getting the compromise one. Okay, that, okay, that, and, yeah. and if anybody wants to help getting signatures for the compromise one, I have Susan Bonilla's stuff. So um, let me know, and I can get you stuff to get signatures for the She can collect those out of the, the parking lot. Out of the parking lot uh, outside. Yeah, out of the parking lot. Come see me after. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, the, uh, um, so basically, and then you have uh, uh, Molly Mungers. And I just read, in Molly Mungers, people have asked, which of these is the best? You know, for the educational set point of view, Molly Mungers is absolutely the best. It brings in the most funding. So for my point of view, woohoo, we, we would get like $30 million next year if it passes. It's huge. But, but um, you know, buying a lottery ticket could also get me millions of dollars. And at this point in time, you know, Molly Mungers, unfortunately, is polling between 35 and 40 percent. So the likelihood of that all of a sudden jumping up and being able to get 50 percent of the votes is very unlikely. What I've heard statistically, the research I've read, is that if a tax measure at this time of the year is not polling at or above 60 percent, it doesn't necessarily have a strong chance of passing. The, what I just read is a, a poll just came out of USC testing the governors uh, and the CFT, their, their, their group one, and it polled at about 64%. So that one does look like currently that it's carrying, because basically the reason why they say it has to be up above 60% is none of the negative, even though they read you a negative statement when they do the polling, that's not the same thing as getting multiple TV ads telling you why you shouldn't vote for a tax. Because I think inherently we would all vote no on a tax. We sort of need to be educated on why we would vote for it. It's a lot easier to convince us not to. And so given that there's no real uh, emphasis out there to say why you shouldn't vote on it, you need a high level of, uh, you know, of certainty that it could pass. So right now the dual, the dual combination uh, proposal brought in more money than the governor's. The governor's is relying on a half cent sales tax. Uh, his dual one relies on taxing people that are make, uh, individuals that are making above two hundred fifty thousand dollars or couples that are making above five hundred thousand dollars. And instead of, instead of being a half cent sales tax, it lowers it down to a twenty five uh, cent sales tax. And uh, and so that was part of their combination. But it does it still actually according to actual what I've read it, it does collect as much or a little bit more than the governor's tax proposal alone. So again, the divergence in this line and this line is this is my only concern with any of these tax proposals besides Mrs. Bungers is that you know it's like the it's it's like uh, when we passed uh, the lottery. You know everybody thinks aren't you guys fixed because of the lottery? And the answer is just like Prop 98 didn't fix us. The lottery didn't fix us. All, all it does is create flat funding. If the governor's budget proposal compared to last year, if the governor's uh, new tax proposal passes currently, what they're saying is that next year we get $5,208. So basically that would be flat funding. So my only concern is, is that the people of the community might, might think that we're going to get this whole new rush of funding when in reality it keeps us flat funding and what, is it, what does it do? It prevents us from going down. Now again, some of that negative um, you know, verbiage out there, the Republicans just came forward with their, ta with their um, uh, funding initiative where they, they, they say that you can create a, a budget that doesn't cut education and doesn't have to raise taxes. So that's going to just be some of the sort of the negative information out there around the tax proposal. But I think what it uses in the analysis of their proposal, it uses some of the gimmicks that has gotten us up in trouble. It relies heavily on deferrals, which basically means funding we're supposed to get you this year, you put off the next year, and it, and it, it, it relies heavily on one time. It basically relies on gimmicks that have gotten us into trouble, and, and that is, you know, so it might create a one-year solution, but it doesn't create a multiple-year solution. But again, it's part of the, you know, if you could put it out there, then, you know, people might believe that the 
problem can be solved without having to uh, generate new taxes, and therefore they wouldn't vote yes. So, yes. Real quick, so the Mike Purple line, that's the, the governor's budget that you were talking about, the, the quarter percent sales tax. The dual would be a little bit higher than that? No, this is, this is well, the governor's. The this right here is if his tax proposal uh, passes, this is where we're supposed to be. Okay, and that's the one with the quarter percent and the, the tax on the rich. Yes, the, the, and the twenty two hundred fifty thousand okay. dollars and above. Yes. Okay. So and then the, the half percent sales tax one is that. That's the it keep, it's the same line. Basically, I think what's going to happen okay. is that he. he I mean, uh, you guys, I talked to you enough. You get it. In in December, part of his proposal was to cut transportation funding in half. So for a district like ours. That was equivalent to about a $35 per pupil cut. It's a $1.1 million cut. But what he found is, is that small rural districts, they're not small on, on paper. You know, they could be 150 square miles, 200 square miles, but they'd only have 400 kids in them. We're, we're going to lose somewhere between 20 to 25% of their district budget because their district budget was huge when it came to transportation because, because of the size of their district and everything. And so those districts truly could have gone belly up if he would have made that cut. And so what the legislature did is voted to move that from a transportation cut to a, to a cut on our general fund revenue limit. So it went from a $35 reduction to a $42 reduction. And so what the governor has now proposed is that, and I'm getting ahead of it, it doesn't matter, but what he's now proposed is that in order not to do that transportation cut, Part of his initial proposal was to take $2 billion, I think it's $8 billion of our funding is currently being deferred from one, you know, one, one payment to another, and he was going to use, instead of increasing our budgets at all, he was going to just do, take $2 billion to pay off some of that deferral, because to bring the money from one year to back into the year where we're really supposed to receive it, he has to have funding this year to be able to do that. So he was going to take $2.4 billion, I believe, of the revenue that was being generated from the tax to pay down the deferrals. Well, instead of doing that, he has said, I'll take $1.8 billion of that $2.4, and I will use it in lieu of the cut to transportation. So that was part of his proposal. In the compromise proposal, where it might generate some more revenue, my hypothesis is, He'll use any new revenue to pay off the deferrals, so we won't see any additional funding for ADA. But he'll, you know, we, he won't use the money to give us more funds. He'll pay down the deferrals. Now we'll probably know more of that in his May revise on May 15th. So that's a hypothesis on my on my part. But I'm just looking at what his original proposal was, and then what he compromised to. And if he gets more funding, I'm I'm assuming he's going to go back to that original proposal along with this compromise. So I don't think we'll see, I don't think this line will go up. It would be great if it would. I don't think this line's gonna go up, but I think what he'll just do is start paying down the deferrals, which have to, has to occur someday. Another real quick, the, the taxes we're talking about, you mentioned something about 50%. So all these passes seem to be passed with 50%, right? 50% plus one. Plus one. They don't have to be 66 and two thirds. No, that's only par local parcel taxes. Yeah, so statewide okay. initiatives, our, our 50 50 percent so it's not even our 55 percent okay. so did I just lose everybody or are you sort of with me okay. I think that the, the question I think that I'm hearing is what does it mean when you know the, the, what are the deferrals and that basically means I'll talk about that in a minute but deferrals are basically there are funds that we were supposed to like get this May that in order to balance the budget in the past what they did instead of saying we're going to cut education they took some of our May payment and they deferred it until July of next year. So on their books, they get to write it off of their budget this year. But but in, so basically, what it does is it, it puts pressure on us to either have a large and larger cash in our bank to be able to deal with those deferrals, or we are forced to go get short-term loans to deal with those deferrals. Which so it puts the pressure on the that larger fund that carry over. Exactly. Them. Exactly. So a larger fund balance allows a school district not to have to go out for short-term loans and pay the interest on those loans. So yes, that's why the, 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 a healthy ending fund balance in this current budget predicament is helpful. 